Chapter 25, Not Exactly a Secret Stark Mansion, Los Angeles, California January 28, 2007, 0930H Local Okay. New Rule Naruto cooks every time he's here. Pepper moaned out when she tasted Naruto's version of English breakfast. She had no idea how Naruto converted their half-cooked meals to one of the most glorious meals she ever had. She finally understood why Shikugakure is hauling cash. With Naruto's recipe, everyone would be tripping over themselves for it. Seconded. Tony said vehemently. If he's cooking, call me anytime. Rodi said. How the hell did you make freshly squeezed OJ this good? While everyone was praising Naruto for his cooking, he's sitting on the corner of table pouting while eating. He can't believe Pepper would ban ramen. As they were eating, Happy decided to walk in, looking a little pissed. So I just got off talking to Kate, do you know what she said? Happy said to Tony while holding his phone. Who's Kate? Tony asked. Being a rich ex-playboy really makes it hard to distinguish female names sometimes. Kate Maser. Happy said, expecting Tony to remember her. You know, assistant director of the FBI Kate Maser. Tony still didn't recognize the name. Happy hated to continue, but he wanted Tony to remember her to make the following conversation easier. 2K turn of the century party, redhead in a black dress. Happy finally said, reminding Tony of the night they met and supposedly had a one-night stand. Damn. The one who looks like a model? She's AD now? Tony asked unintentionally slipping more than he wanted to say, which caused Pepper to slap Tony in the arm and give him a disapproving stare. Anyways. Happy continued hoping to continue the conversation. He served himself some breakfast. She said there are no spooks assigned to you guys or your house. That includes the CIA, NSA, Homeland, and DOD. She's going to send someone to look into it. Happy said before taking a bite of the eggs and bacon. Damn. This is good. Rody. Try to find something on your end. I don't want anyone else to know about Morgan. Tony said seriously. No problem. I have some black ops contacts. Maybe it's something from there. Rody replied. Being a relatively high-ranked personnel, he acknowledges that the military and other agencies are always doing questionable stuff. Tony also has some experience with black ops since they first test a lot of his projects. Why don't you let me handle them? It'll only take a few minutes. Naruto offhandedly suggested. You? Ha. Come on. It's one thing to take our mob thugs by surprise, but dealing with trained agents? That's a whole other ballpark. Rody exclaimed. His pride doesn't want to concede that some guy would be able to hold himself against rigorously trained agents. Wait a second. I saw what he could do. If no one officially sanctioned the guys surveilling us, Naruto could take them down now and ask questions later. Tony explained. He was seriously considering sicking Naruto against those guys. There's no one taking down anyone. We are going to finish this nice breakfast and let that FBI AD handle the situation. Pepper said, chastising everyone while adding a little bite when referring to the Kate Maser. Pepper faced Naruto and asked, So what got you in a rush the other day? Oh, oh. I got a date. Naruto said with a wide smile. You ran out of the house in a hurry to get a date? Why the hell did it take you a day and a half to get a date? Tony asked incredulously. Well, there was an emergency I have to look into. That took me around a day to straighten out, but by the end of the day, I got a date. I've meant to ask her out for some time, 
but responsibilities got in the way. Naruto explained. So you knew her for quite a while? Pepper asked, suddenly interested in the conversation. Not exactly, it's more of an I know of her kind of situation, but we already met personally before. She hot? Rodi asked without tact. Oh yeah, definitely. Naruto answered with a grin. But it's more than that. Pepper appreciated that Naruto asked a girl out not only because of her look. She can hurt you more ways than you can imagine. The woman can defend herself. That's when Pepper knew she spoke too soon. What? Is she a cop or a soldier? Happy asked. Nope. Naruto answered with a mischievous smile. Pepper had that bad feeling again. Every time she saw Naruto with that smile, she just knew another headache is coming her way. She's a spy. Yup, that migraine is going to hit her hard. Rodi, who decided that it was the right time to drink some OJ, spat everything behind him, and went into a coughing fit. How the hell did you meet a spy? Tony asked, completely ignoring his best friend's predicament. Remember how I said I lost all my stuff on the way to Vegas? Yes. Tony drawled out. She's the one that gave me a ride to Vegas. She was on vacation doing something in your company. Naruto casually answered. This time, it's Tony's turn to take a double take. You mean there was a spy in the company, and you didn't tell me? Tony said in mock seriousness. Get over yourself. You know you have spies in your company. I bet you even know them. Naruto said before facing Pepper. Quick. How many spies are there in all your US-based main company facilities? 127. Pepper said, a little shocked. How the hell can someone know that they knew about the spies? A whole new secret division had been made just to keep that a secret. Naruto then faced Happy and asked. How many are corporate spies? 96. Happy replied. If Pepper has no problem revealing what they know, there's no way he would raise a fuss now. Wrong. Only 84 of what you know are corporate spies. Other countries sent the rest. Naruto said. That revelation concerned Pepper. How can Naruto know what they do and don't know? But the revelations are not over. On top of the 127, there are also 33 deep cover spies that you haven't discovered yet. As for the whole Stark conglomerate, there are 2,866 spies in total. The one I asked out for a date, she just went in and took care of a deep cover spy from China you didn't know about. I say that's a positive mark in my books. Naruto finally finished, leaving everyone gobsmacked. Rodi was the first one to recover. He immediately stood up and drew his gun, aiming it directly at Naruto, who just kept eating. Who are you, and what did you do before? Rodi asked. If the man is as skilled in combat as Tony makes him out to be, he can only be three things, ex-special forces, mercenary, or an operator, which is a more combat-oriented spy. All of which doesn't precisely inspire relaxing thoughts in their current predicament. Pepper rapidly pulled Morgan away from the unfolding situation, her only thought is to keep her safe. Tony and Happy are trying to defuse the crisis to keep them from escalating. As I said before, I am Naruto Uzumaki, and I was a freelance contractor. Naruto answered slowly. Freelance contractor is another term used for mercenary or assassin. Rodi stated while getting a little more twitchy-fingered. Everyone is now seriously worried about what would happen next. Damn. Is that what that means? I guess that's why my date was tensed when I said that. Naruto mused. Rodi saw that Naruto's attention is slipping off from him, so he snapped his fingers to get it back again. 
Oh hey. Where was I? Freelance contractor. Happy helpfully added. Right. Naruto said while giving Happy an appreciative nod. I really was a freelance contractor. Like I would do almost any job. From menial tasks like house cleaning and face painting all the way to the hard harder ones like search and retrieval and bodyguard jobs. Hell, one time, I helped build a bridge while protecting a drunk architect. Good times. Naruto finished describing his job description while having a nostalgic look on his face. What the hell kind of job is that? Rody asked, not thinking there's a job that does all that. Told you. Freelance contractor. Naruto answered while looking at Rody like he's stupid. So you did bodyguard jobs? Is that why you approached Tony? Rody asked, still trying to figure out Naruto. Nope. Didn't even know him then. I just figured out who he is when I traveled. Happy decided to ask something that's been bugging him and Pepper. Rody already started asking anyway. How did you find out about the inner workings of Stark Industries? Two words. Drinking game. Naruto said like it explained everything. When he saw no one got it, he continued. A lot of your employees are lightweight. I met some during my travels. When I figured out they work for you, I decided I want to know ask more questions. It kind of spiraled from there. Pepper latched onto what he said and said. No one would just tell you sensitive corporate secrets. Hey. People just kind of trust me. I'm still staying here, am I? Naruto stated the obvious. He got you there. Tony said towards Pepper which just irked her. With all that cleared up, Rody put that gun away. Everyone sit down, and let's eat before the food gets any colder. Rody holstered his gun, but still looking at Naruto warily. Pepper sat Morgan back on her chair, and thought about how can it be so different from just adding one person in the scenario. Happy is thinking about what Naruto said about the spies in the company. So now everything has chilled out, we can now discuss something more important, about someone's date with a venerable super spy. He said, oozing with giddiness. So, what's your plan? I don't know. I've only been on a few dates, and my knowledge doesn't seem to apply this time. What? That won't do for my business partner. Let me give you some advice. Tony sagely said while pushing Naruto out of the room. There's no way in hell he'll discuss these things in front of Pepper. Pepper saw how excited Tony was and knew immediately that it would be a recipe for disaster. James. Can you just go with them? Don't let Tony get overboard. Pepper requested. On it. Rody said before standing up and following the pair. Triskelion, Washington, D.C. January 28, 2007, 1300 H. Local. An older man in a suit is pacing back and forth inside the director's office in the Triskelion. He's anxiousness visible for everyone to see. His name is Alexander Pierce, the current secretary of the World Security Council. He's a 5 feet 10 inches, 75 years old, Caucasian man, with dirty blonde hair and blue eyes. He worked for the State Department, where his work led him to be a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize, which he turned down. His imp impressive resume fast-tracked him to be a secretary for the World Security Council. He used his position to nominate Nick Fury as the new director, which formed some type of friendship between the two. But of course, there are always wolves dressed as lambs. Pierce is secretly an undercover Hydra agent recruited during his time in the State Department. He's the highest positioned mole of Hydra in the SHIELD and the U.S. government. His job is to subtly recruit agents for Hydra, as well as ensure the organization is hidden until they're ready to show themselves. 
The reason Pierce is in Fury's office is that he heard that his private jet has landed. The fuck-up in Budapest already cost them Bloom, one of Hydra's most effective finance administrators, and now he heard they have nothing to show for it. He was the one that alerted the Hydra's high council about Romanov's impromptu mission. The council immediately pounced on the opportunity to grab Romanov in hopes of finding out who the information broker called Nine Tails is. His sources told him about Romanov, Barton, Carlson, and even Fury himself knowing who the Nine Tails himself, with Romanov being the most likely. Fury supposedly saw a photo of the Nine Tails face, but there was only one copy, and it is heavily guarded. The whole plan in Budapest was to capture Romanov and force her to tell them what she knows while using Barton as a bargaining chip. They wouldn't even try to do something as daring before, but desperate times call for drastic measures. The Nine Tails is just becoming too big of a problem only to be considered a nuisance. The son of a bitch has managed to decrease their income by as much as 60% in just the first year he's been active. Terrorist cells, drug cartels, government financial overflow, and corporate profits through off-the-book operations are being taken down one by one by selling undisputable evidence to the authorities. They can't even control them in the sh shadows anymore since Nine Tails just goes with another group if they don't act on the information. That's why they also sent their ultimate weapon, the Winter Soldier, to make sure everything goes smoothly. The plan in Budapest was going as planned when the Nine Tails himself decided to fix his supposed fuck-up. He never thought that killing the original seller and meeting the general themselves to ambush Romanov and Barton would call for the Nine Tails to show himself. He would usually be happy to know that Hydra could finally capture or kill him, but the whole thing was literally a bloodbath. Only the Winter Soldier managed to escape, but his metal arm was turned into a venerable pile of scrap. The only good thing that happened was that the Nine Tails surrendered himself when he urged Fury to send reinforcements in the guise of helping the team the moment Bloom went dark. He watched the live feed of the guards bringing Nine Tails in the Omega cell, excited to finally the face of the man who's fucking with them, but he guessed his excitement came by too soon. No one can remove the mask and the man himself won't remove it, so they were forced to leave it on. Pierce also watched Fury interrogating the Nine Tails, but Fury closed the mic off before he went in. He can't even use a lip-reading program since Fury is facing away from the camera, and the Nine Tails was still wearing the goddamned mask. In the end, Fury placed the cell on lockdown, effectively cutting the feed off. When it resumed, everyone was a little shell-shocked, and the Nine Tails was nowhere to be seen. Preliminary reports from the raft said that the man was never imprisoned in the first place, only a clone was placed inside the cell. Only one thing caused his anxiousness, the possibility of the Nine Tails getting information on Bloom and selling it to Fury. Pierce is only there to see if Fury learned something new. Pierce turned around when he heard the door open. He saw Fury walking in with Carlson and Hill on his right and left, respect respectively. What the hell happened? Pierce said with as much authoritative tone as he can muster. The Nine Tails never surrendered. He just left a clone behind, and that's who we caught. Fury said smoothly while walking towards his desk. As for Budapest, I say he did us a favor, although he could try to be a little cleaner. Is there anything you found out about Budapest? Pierce asked, keeping a calm demeanor. If Fury found out about Hydra, they might need to push forward with their plan even if Project Insight still has at least five years before completion. They're an organized paramilitary group, and they killed the original seller just to ambush my team. We haven't found out more about them, but I will find out how they knew about the mission. Fury said with conviction. Pierce was immediately on high alert. The only reason Fury still hasn't found out about them was because they stay well away from his radar. Let me handle that one. I'll assign Garrett or Sitwell on it. You already have too much on your plate already. Pierce suggested. Hoping if he assigned it to either of them, they can control the investigation. 
Sure, go ahead. But I want a copy of every report they send out. Fury said. Of course. Pierce said while secretly releasing a sigh of relief. Did you find out about anything on this Nine Tails? Cause he's got to be stopped or at least work for us. He's making everyone look bad. He asked, hoping to get a new lead. Not much. The only new information I have is that he liked fucking with people, and has eyes and ears everywhere. He implied that he only showed up in Budapest since he saw a different man show up as the seller. Other than that, I have no idea, and I hate not knowing something. Pierce processed the information and came up with one conclusion. If they mess another one of his intelligence, they can make him show up. Before I leave, why did you lock down the cell? Because he said he could get out any time. I just wanted to be sure he can't. I guess it was no use after all since it popped into a cloud of smoke after a while. Fury answered, mixing lies and truth. All right. I'll let Garrett handle the investigation. He's just traveling around. It's easier for him to get some info. I'll see you some other time, Nick. Pierce said before leaving the room. Silence permeates the room until Fury walked over to his desk and pushed a button. It was one of the personal features Fury added to the office. It will cut off all forms of outgoing communication in the office, even hardline, making it impossible to eavesdrop in it. The only way to get something is to leave a remote recording device inside the room and retrieving it for later. Add Garrett and Sitwell to the list. Fury ominously ordered when he was sure no one else could listen in. Already added, sir. Coulson said a little subdued. He and Sitwell were classmates inside Shield Academy and grew to be friends. How many does that make it? Fury asked, already knowing the answer. Three. Pierce, Sitwell, and Garrett. What are we talking about, boss? Maria Hill finally interjected, not appreciating being left out of the conversation. Maria Hill is a 5 feet 8 inches, 25-year-old Caucasian woman with black hair and blue eyes. She was personally hired directly by Fury two years ago from the army. Her sharp mind and eye for details led her to become one of the fastest rising stars in the agency. She's being groomed by Fury to be the next deputy director since Coulson wants to remain to be a field agent. Her current job is to be Fury's secretary, as well as led some missions in her free time. Funny you should ask Hill because we're going to need your help. But first, let me ask you a question. Fury said while fixing her with an intense stare. Sure, boss. Hill answered. If Fury asked you to do something, you don't say no since it usually deals with matters of national security. What would you do when I say Hydra is growing inside of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Fury asked. Hill had to pause to process what Fury said. After a few seconds, she finally decided to answer the question with her own. What? Chapter 26, A Chaotic Start Clint's Homestead, Missouri January 28, 2007, 1600 H Local Homestead, an apt name for Clint's Haven The whole five hectares of land surrounding his home were bought through dozens of shell companies and overseas transactions, making it virtually impossible to find details about it. Fury helped him set it up in 1999 when he married his high school sweetheart, Laura, as a precaution against the dozens of enemies he made during his time as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. The house itself was built using his own hands through a year of hard work. The barn and storage shed followed close after. As for the farm they have planned, that's still up in the air. His erratic workdays make it virtually impossible to maintain it. The only reason the house was still standing was because of Laura. Laura Barton is a 5 feet 3 inches, 29-year-old Caucasian woman with dark brown hair and brown eyes. 
she and Clint have already been dating since they were 14. Since then, she knew that being with Clint would be a daunting task, and it proved to be correct, but the love they had for each other made it possible to weather through the challenges and made the best of the situation. She can honestly say that she is happy with how her life turned out. Clint considers Laura as some kind of a martyr. Having a family with a man who's gone most of the time is already a sacrifice, but living in a semi-isolated area for their safety, well, that's just crazy. That just made Clint love Laura even more. Their first real challenge was when Lila was born. Living in isolation would stunt her development. It's a good thing he worked for a spy agency cause Fury was able to set up solid false identities for Laura and Lila, making it possible for Lila to attend classes safely in the coming school year. Clint is now landing in an open field in front of his home. Recently, he's been using a decommissioned Quinjet to come home. It's stealthy, fast, and, most of all, untraceable with only a push of a button. A heavily pregnant Laura was playing with Lila in the living room when she saw through the window the telltale signs of an invisible plane landing on the field. She still can't believe that technology has already progressed that far no matter how many times she saw it. Excited to meet her husband again, she urged Lila to meet him at the door. Come on, Lila. Let's meet, Daddy. Laura said with a smile. Lila immediately stood up and bounded towards the door with her mother not far behind. Lila stopped at the door and impatiently waiting for her mother, remembering that she shouldn't be opening the front door without her parents' permission. Go on. Laura said, giving permission. Lila opened it without a second wasted and went outside. Clint was walking down the path when he saw the door open, revealing Lila and Laura, causing him to smile involuntarily. Honey. I brought a guest. Clint said, pointing at Natasha not far behind him carrying a small suitcase. Ever since Clint first brought Natasha to the homestead, she had been staying there when she can get to the point that they gave her a room. Nat and Laura immediately hit it off even though they have different life experiences. Lila jumped to Clint's arms the moment he stepped on the porch, and Laura gave him a kiss and a hug, which they kept PG entirely. Laura then walked over to Nat and hugged her. I thought you wouldn't come home for another two weeks? Laura asked while hurting them all inside. She's happy that they're home early, but it usually means they were in a hard mission, and Fury gave them time off. It's a long story. We'll tell you about it over dinner. But for now, I want to change into something more comfortable. Clint said, referring to the combat gear he's still wearing. Natasha already changed into her casual, were before leaving Washington. Come on, Lil. Help Daddy choose what he's going to wear. Clint then carried Lila and his duffel bag up the stairs. Laura waited for a while to make sure Clint is in the bedroom before leading Natasha to the kitchen. How close were you? Laura asked Natasha with a hint of fear in her voice. Natasha knew this conversation would come up the moment Laura saw them, but it doesn't make it easier for her to answer. Too close. Natasha finally said after a few seconds. She took a deep breath and continued. By all accounts, we shouldn't even hear. Only unlikely reinforcement got us out of there in one piece. Nat's answer caused Laura to tear up a little bit. No wife ever wanted to hear her husband almost died, but Laura decided long ago that if she were going to be a wife to Clint, she would at least try to know everything that's happening. Who? Laura asked in a quiet voice. You remember the guy we've been chasing around? Naruto? Natasha asked. Laura nodded, remembering how stressed out Clint every time he comes home. That's one of the re reasons why Cooler has been conceived. He's the one that came to help. Apparently, he doesn't want when the info he sold went bad. Clint would probably tell a more subdued version, but overall, everything just got more complicated. 
Clint and Lila came down a few minutes later. The family decided it's better to have an early dinner. Clint and Laura prepared the meal, just enjoying each other company, while Natasha and Lila are playing in the living room. As expected, Clint told a heavily censored version of what happened over dinner, while giving a hint at parts he can't explicitly say like Hydra agents in S.H.I.E.L.D. and the captain being possibly still alive. The conversation moved on to lighter topics as the meal continued forward. After finishing the meal and cleaning up the table, Lila moved to the living room to watch some TV while the adults set up on the island so they can still keep an eye on her. Ask Nat what's her plan tomorrow. Come on, ask her. Clint said, urging Laura. His demeanor was battling between annoyance and excitement. Okay. Sheesh. Calm down, hun. Laura said, trying to bring down her husband's nervous energy, but it didn't do anything. She finally faced Nat just to move the conversation along. Along. What's your plan for tomorrow? Natasha weirdly turned slightly red, but she still showed a calm and collected exterior. I have a date. Natasha answered candidly. Like for a mission? Laura asked, knowing that Natasha does a lot of seduction jobs. She still doesn't know precisely what Natasha's training was like, but she had an idea. I'm not sure. Natasha said while having a contemplative look. I'm just going to say halfway in between a mission and personal thing. How did that happen? After we brought in Naruto, he kind of forced us into a situation where we had to bargain with him for information. The first thing he asked was something that could be expected, but the second one hit everyone by surprise. Natasha explained. He asked you out, didn't he? Yup. Natasha answered with a nod. I said yes, of course, but everyone is trying to make it a surveillance mission. Clint here wanted to air support for Christ's sake. She finished with an exasperated sigh. Laura shot Clint a shocked and disappointed look. What? You haven't seen the guy. He's like an annoying kid who turned into Robocop. Clint defended himself before standing up and retreating towards Lila. He's the same guy you met in Vegas, right? Laura asked. The same one. Fuck. Natasha added the last part, when she suddenly remembered a detail that might have slipped their minds. What? I might have forgotten that he may or may not be an alien. Oh was the only thing that came out of Laura's mouth. Does he at least look human? Yes. A cute one too. Wait, I got a picture. Natasha said before fishing out her phone from her pocket. She started scrolling on her phone when she found a picture of Naruto from her car footage. Here he is. Wow. How can someone look cute and ruggedly handsome? Laura suddenly blurted out. Is that Whiskers? What is he? An alien humanoid cat? More like a fox. Natasha corrected. His codename is Nine Tails, which can be linked to a nine-tailed fox demon in Japanese culture. Huh. You learn something new every day. Laura said with a thoughtful look. So when and where are you meeting? 8 a.m., but as for where, he said he'd pick me up. Natasha said, slightly unsure. How would he manage that? We're basically in the middle of nowhere. I don't know, but I'm going to make him work for it. Natasha said with a giggle. She then looked at Laura's stomach and asked, asked, you are due any week now, right? Any day. Laura corrected with a groan. Don't get me wrong, I love this kid, but I just can't wait for him to pop out. Is the midwife ready? Natasha asked. Yes, but there might be a problem with that. Another pregnancy has a close due date with ours, 
only a difference of two days. If the labor starts at the same time, only one of us would be attended. Laura said, visibly worried. Clint decided to walk in and interject conversation carrying Lila. I'll tuck Lila in and head to bed myself. Good night, Han, don't stay up too late. Clint said before kissing Laura. He then faced Nat and said in a serious voice, May God have mercy on your soul. Before running away. Natasha just let it slide, she'll get him back tomorrow after her date. I think I'll head to bed too. Laura stood up and hugged Natasha. I hope you have a great time tomorrow. Good night. She whispered to Nat's ear. Okay. I'll just stay up for a little bit. Natasha said before waving Laura off. She stared at her luggage and sighed, guess I should prepare my gear. Already surrendering to the thought that the date would not be a typical one. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. January 29th, 2007, 0745H Local. Wow. You pulled out all the stops. Laura reacted when she saw Natasha walk down the stairs. She's wearing dark blue fitted jeans, a black camisole under a leather jacket, and brown boots. It's not too much, right? Natasha asked with an uncharacteristically nervous voice. No. It's perfect. He's going to love it. Laura said while hugging Natasha. She then started patting Nat when she felt something under her outfit. Don't take this the wrong way, but why are you carrying what felt like a whole armory? And are you wearing your bulletproof jacket? Clint was not overreacting. Every time I'm with Naruto, something is happening. But to be fair, I only met him twice. Natasha said before, both of them walked towards the kitchen where Clint is cooking breakfast. You have your phone and band? Clint asked without looking behind him. What are you? My dad? Natasha answered back with a bit of attitude. Clint turned around and gave Natasha a disapproving stare. Just answer the question. Yes, dad. Have it with me. She said sarcastically. Where are you meeting him again? Clint continued, glossing over Natasha's attitude. I assumed here. Clint stumbled when he heard the answer. No one should know about this place, and judging from Laura's lack of reaction, she already knew what Natasha said. What? I said here. Natasha answered without a second thought. That shouldn't be a surprise. He's a teleporting super soldier. He probably knows everything about us the moment we started following his trail. She offhandedly finished. No way. This place doesn't even show up on any maps. Clint said, not entirely confident with his assertion. You're still saying that after everything? Natasha said with a shake of her head. That's when they heard the sound of a motorcycle getting closer. Son of a bitch. Clint exclaimed under his breath before running out of the front door, making sure that he grabbed the bow and quiver hanging near the door. When he got outside, he saw a man riding a large motorcycle breaking through the tree line. Maybe bullets just don't work. Arrows might be the way to go. He whispered to himself while knocking an arrow. When Natasha and Laura finally exited the home, they only saw Clint releasing the arrow, which headed straight towards the man on the motorcycle. The arrow pierced the helmet's face shield, presumably piercing also the man's face. Clint! Laura shouted. Shocked at the series of events. She was going to charge at her husband and pummel him to the ground when Natasha pulled her back. Let me go. He can't just kill anyone when somebody shows up. She shouted while trying to get free from Natasha's hold, but it just gets tighter. He's not dead. Look at him. 
He's still going. Natasha said a little forcefully while pointing at the still rapidly approaching motorcycle. How? Laura asked in disbelief. That's Naruto. No other way to go about that. Natasha answered like it explained everything. Naruto finally reached the front porch of the house. He removed his helmet, which suddenly disappeared, and immediately started ranting. What the hell? I just borrowed that helmet. You just shoot everyone you meet? How have you even got married? Of course, I'll shoot you. You just showed up in a place that could be considered a black site. And besides, you took my bow. Clint answered back. You want your bow? Naruto asked while pulling something behind him. Here you go. He then tossed a five-foot-long case. Told you, you'll get it back. Natasha and Laura are just watching the play-by-play. -play. Are they always like this? Laura asked. They only met twice, including now, so yeah. Natasha confirmed. Naruto finally noticed Laura and Natasha standing behind Clint. He was immediately mesmerized by Natasha. Wow. You look great. Naruto said seriously. Thank you. You don't look too bad too. Natasha complimented back while eyeing Naruto. He's currently wearing navy blue jeans, a white shirt with fox prints covered by a burnt orange jacket, and brown biker boots. The jacket accentuated his broad shoulders. This is for you. Naruto said while offering Natasha a bouquet of assorted flowers with a box of Horatian kanai in the center. The knives are special. Just throw it anywhere, and I'll know when you're in trouble. I guess those would be more useful than, than chocolate. Thank you. That's sweet of you. I'll just place it inside. She said while pocketing a Horatian kanai. I might need this later. Natasha then went inside. You must be Laura. I'm sorry for coming by unannounced. I hope you can accept this as an apology. Naruto said to Laura while rolling over a mammoth cooler that he retrieved from somewhere behind him. These are all ready-to-eat meals. By the way, Clint and Fury did an excellent job of hiding you. Thank you, I guess. Laura replied awkwardly. Natasha exited the house again a little more excited. Let's go. She said, pulling Naruto towards the bike. Where are we going anyway? It's a surprise. Naruto said with a grin. He then handed over an all-black helmet towards her. Safety first. How do you do that? Natasha said, taking the helmet and fixing it on her head. Do what? The taking something out of thin air thing. Trade secret. We have a lot of time to get to know each other. Naruto answered before he spotted Clint opening the case. Come on. We want to be far away from here when he sees what's inside. Naruto said while quickly riding the motorcycle. Natasha didn't even try to question him and mounted the bike behind Naruto. Grab onto something. Naruto advised before rushing away from the house. When they're around 100 m away, Natasha could faintly hear Clint shouting something about his bow being pink. She giggled uncontrollably, immediately enjoying the start. Naruto rode hard until they reached the tree lean, where they suddenly disappeared, bike and all. Chapter 27, The Date Part 1 Rome, Italy January 29, 2007, 1515 H. Local Ugh. That's even worse than the first time. Natasha said to no one in particular, but Naruto heard it through the microphone, and sound system built into the helmet. Ha ha ha. You took it a whole lot better than when I first experienced it. I puked my guts out. 
Naruto confessed while laughing. And you used it without telling me first. I'm wearing a helmet, think about it for a second. Natasha chastised. Naruto did as she asked, and it doesn't paint a pretty picture. Wow. That's bad. I'm sorry. Naruto apologized, properly chastised. Just remember next time. Natasha instructed. That's when she decided to look around the surroundings they're riding through. She noticed that the old buildings and classical architecture not found anywhere in the U.S. Are we in Rome? Yep. I found the second greatest food after ramen at a restaurant around here when I was traveling. I'm bringing you there. Naruto said visibly excited while maneuvering around Rome's side roads. Wow. You're pulling all the stops. Natasha teased. Of course. I have one shot to impress the lady. Naruto declared vehemently. Natasha couldn't help but laugh at Naruto's enthusiasm. And we have arrived, my lady. Naruto said in an aristocratic voice before stopping in front of a small restaurant. Natasha dismounted the bike and removed her helmet. She was fully expecting Naruto to bring her to some fancy restaurant to impress her, but this is a whole lot better. She turned around and saw Naruto locking the bike, that's when she noticed something. What make and model is your bike? I don't recognize it. Natasha asked, genuinely interested. One of her hobbies that doesn't directly relate to her job is working on her bikes. She loves how she can build up a monster of a motorcycle and being able to tame it. It's like a cathartic experience for her. This built it myself. Naruto answered like it wasn't a big deal. He started building the bike when he was in Japan and saw a motorcycle racing tournament. The moment he saw those high-speed two-wheelers, he was hooked. He bought five different bike models, Honda CBR1000RR, Kawasaki ZX-10R, Suzuki GSX-R1000, Yamaha YZF-R1, and finally, Ducati Supersport 1000DS. He had teams of clones disassemble and reassemble all of the bikes, trying to understand how each of the parts works. It took three months before the clones are satisfied and dispelled, giving him all the knowledge on how the bike works. He used his knowledge of the parts and the incredibly versatile chakra metal to create the ultimate superbike. Even now, when a new superbike comes out, he buys it and studies it, looking for any ways he can improve his bike. You built that? Where did you get the parts? I can't recognize most of it. Natasha asked, her enthusiasm rising. You shouldn't. Naruto offhandedly said while calling Natasha over to analyze his bike. When she got closer, she noticed that she couldn't even identify the material. I started from scratch. Studied every bike I can get my hands on until I have an idea on how to build my own. I made everything myself, including the nuts, bolts, engine, suspension. The whole thing is customized to my specification. I call it Raijin. Named it after the Japanese god of thunder, lightning, and storms. If it were possible to orgasm at just the thought of the superbike, Natasha would have have done it multiple times at this point. point. What are the specs? Natasha asked quietly, excited, and afraid at the same time to hear the answer. Naruto's grin just got even more feral, which weirdly attracted her. Raijin is an 8-cylinder, 3,000 cc's, 1,000 horsepower beast of a machine that can go from 0 to 100 km per hour in 1.5 seconds flat and has a top speed of 500 km per hour. Naruto answered probably. Of course, all of those are without the few Injutsu enhancements activated. Only the chakra needed to transform the properties of the chakra metal are currently running through it. He still hadn't tested how much the few injutsu improvements would affect the superbike. As for the fuel, it uses premium gasoline, 
but it can also run on chakra input. Natasha is practically drooling. The bike Naruto made is probably the most powerful street legal machine ever built, and that includes cars. The only more powerful street legal vehicle she can think of is the 1001 HP Bugatti Veyron, and this bike can make the Veyron look like a freaking beetle. On our next date, you're going to help me build one of these. Natasha said with conviction, only realizing what she said after causing her to turn slightly red. So there's a next date? That's good to know. Naruto teased with a wide smile. He then took Natasha's hand and pulled her gently inside the restaurant. Come on. We'll miss our reservation. Natasha saw a typical family restaurant set up on the inside. A few tables and chairs here and there, corner booths for a more private setting, a wine rack, and an open view to the kitchen. There are only around ten employees inside, including the cooks and waiters milling around. A lot of natural lighting is used, which makes the whole ambience more open. Naruto walked to the receptionist and spoke in fluent Italian. Mi scusi. Ho una prenotazion sato il nom di volp. Excuse me. I have a reservation under the name Fox. Naruto said politely. Politely. Certo signore. Fami controller per un momento. Of course, sir. Let me check for a moment. The receptionist replied while opening the reservation book. Mentre CISCI, poi dermi se Leon è dentro? While you're at it, can you tell me if Leon is inside? Naruto asked. The receptionist looked a little surprised that someone knew her boss, but she just answered it like a professional. Si signore. A nel retro. Yes, sir. He's in the back room. She answered before finding a 3.30 reservation for Volt marked with VIP. Seguitemi signore. Abbiamo uno stand reservato per te. Follow me, sir. We have a booth reserved for you. The receptionist said while leading them to a secluded box at the back of the restaurant. Ecosica. Un camerier sera con te a breve. Here we are. A waiter will be with you shortly. She then walked away. I didn't know you speak Italian. Natasha said, impressed. You pick up a lot of things if you have as much free time as I have. Naruto confessed. You still have a lot of free time? Even while running your other business? Referring to Naruto's information brokering and mercenary venture. Yup. The network pretty much runs itself, while the hands-on part just happens from time to time. Naruto explained. You should probably text Coulson or Fury. Why? Not really wanting to let S.H.I.E.L.D. be in her business. Because the jump from Missouri to Rome might have destroyed that watch of yours. Naruto answered while scratching the back of his head. Natasha immediately checked over her watch and saw that it's not moving. She removed it from her wrist and checked the inner mechanism. The moment she opened it, she saw the fried circuits and a part that doesn't belong. Fuck. I'll kill them. I told them no mics. Nat angrily mumbled to herself. She doesn't know if she's worried or happy that the band, band was destroyed. Natasha pocketed the watch and retrieved her phone. She texted Coulson that everything was okay, and they shouldn't panic, but not adding their current location. She wants them to work for it. That's when a man walked over to their table. He's a six feet two inches Italian man with receding pepper-colored hair, brown eyes, and trimmed beard. He also wears a black coat and dark-colored glasses that are perched at the tip of his nose. Natasha stared at the man, trying to remember him. She knows that she met him before but didn't remember when and where. Naruto. You didn't tell me your date is the beautiful Signora Vedova. 
the man said with a knowing smile. Natasha quickly reassessed the situation. She rechecked the entry and exit points as well as the possible number of hostels. While Natasha is formulating an exit plan, the man and Naruto just kept on talking. Awesome, right? I can't believe she said yes. Naruto said while smiling, still not recognizing the fact that he essentially blackmailed her into saying yes. How are you anyway, Leon? He asked the now identified Leon. The mention of the man's name snapped Natasha out of her musing. She recognizes the name. Leon was a New York-based hitman that did several hard jobs that made him a legend in the community. Apparently, reports of his death seven years ago are exaggerated. I'm doing great. The info you gave me two months ago helped a lot. Leon answered. He then faced Natasha and gave a small bow. Pleasure to meet you, Signore Romanoff. I assure you that I am out of the game for a long time. Besides, Naruto here is a friend, and it would be a shame for his date to end abruptly. He reassured with a smile. Nice to meet you too. I see that you are alive and well. Naruto surely has a wide range of friends. Natasha cautiously said. She has no idea if she would report this to S.H.I.E.L.D., but personally, she would just let him be. Leon laughed a little, recognizing that Naruto has a weird collection of acquaintances. So what would it be? Leon asked their choice of meal. I'll have a Caprice with bread and a glass of Chardonnay. Natasha answered without pause. She already decided what she wanted to have when she learned that they are in Italy. And you know what I'll have. Just add a margarita pizza and tiramisu to share. Naruto added his order. Carpaccio and spaghetti a levangol with sparkling water. Got it. Leon stated for confirmation before walking away. There was a small stretch of awkward silence between the two, probably because they have no idea where to start the conversation. Natasha only has been on one real date in her life, which abruptly ended when her date ran away scared. As for Naruto, he has only been on dates with one girl, and they already knew each other for quite a while. Natasha decided to throw caution in the wind and ask the question that's been bugging her for quite a while. Are you human? Naruto suddenly chokes in surprise, hearing the question. Of course, he knows about aliens, but he never considered himself as one. But thinking more about the definition of an alien, he is regarded as one. No. At least I don't think I'm not. He answered, using a loophole. He is a human alien. A bizarre situation if you think about it. Then how can you do the things you do, the teleportation, cloning, and nigh invulnerability? Natasha pushed forward. That's a complicated question with a complicated answer. Naruto thoughtfully said. It should be a third date question, I think, but for now, let's just say I'm special. We haven't even been on a second date, and there's already a third date. Aren't we moving too fast? What else do you think would happen on the third date? Natasha teased this time. Luckily for Naruto, Leon and a pair of waiters served their orders at that time. Your meal is served. Just call me if you need anything. Leon said before walking away. The meal went on smoothly. They just exchanged funny stories and experiences, while making sure nothing to personal would come up. Some questions were answered, but most of them are skirted over, both of them not wanting to scare off a prospective partner. They stayed for two hours until people started to fill the restaurant for the evening rush. Naruto called over Leon so they could check out. Don't worry about the meal. It's on the house. Leon waved off. Thanks, Leon. I'll see you next time. Naruto said without fighting back. Thank you for the meal. 
I hope you can make your business grow. Natasha cordially said. She decided that she won't mess up Leon's new life by putting him in Shield's radar. Leon nodded in appreciation and watched them walk out of the restaurant. He started cleaning the table when he saw a folder on Naruto's chair. He picked it up and opened it. Inside are different pictures of a girl walking around campus. He involuntarily shed a tear from seeing his adoptive daughter. Damn, you're good, Naruto. Leon said to no one in particular. So where to next? Natasha asked when they exited the restaurant. She saw the folder Naruto left behind for Leon, but decided not to say anything about it. I'm going to show you something awesome, and the best part, you can bring it back to Fury. Naruto said while wearing his helmet. But, I think you should wait until the rat's been dealt with. He finished while mounting his bike. Natasha quickly wore her helmet and got on behind Naruto, wrapping her arm around him and pressing herself. She felt a small shiver run through him. I think you just brought your bike so you can feel me behind you. Natasha teased behind him. I'm neither going to confirm or deny that. Naruto answered before revving the bike and shooting off. We're going to do a jump. Just saying. Natasha braced herself before the scenery suddenly changed from an alleyway in Rome into a jungle treeline, with a salvage yard in the distance. Clint's Homestead, Missouri January 29, 2007, 0815H Local Why is my bow pink? Clint shouted. Laura finally understood the pair's dynamic. Naruto messes with Clint, and Clint retaliates. It's a vicious cycle that she can't help but laugh at. She looked over the case of her husband's bow and quiver is and saw a piece of paper. She opened it and read it out loud. Just submerge in hot water for 30 minutes. At least it's not permanent. She said the last part to her husband with a comforting smile. I'm just going to use the bathtub. Clint said with a sigh. He placed his weapons inside the case again so it can be carried easier. Come on, hun. Let's go inside and have breakfast. Clint saw Laura frozen in place a little scared. Hun? Laura? He tried to get her attention. When Laura snapped out of her stupor, she faced Clint and said, My water just broke. Chapter 28, The Date Part 2 Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa January 29, 2007, 1830 H Local Where are we? Natasha quietly asked. Somewhere near Durban. Naruto answered with a shrug. South Africa? What are we doing here? Natasha continued still confused about what they are doing there until she started to connect the dots. The salvage yard in Dunbar is the base of one of the most successful black market weapon sellers, Ulysses Clow. S.H.I.E.L.D. can't even touch him since a lot of influential politicians in Africa and Asia avail his services. Rumor has it that most of his income comes from a heist he did 15 years ago. S.H.I.E.L.D. has no idea what he stole, but it can't be good based on the money trail they were able to dig up. Most of the items went towards illegal research companies, and when they raid those places, they always evacuate the materials first instead of the leaders or researchers. That alone shows how important those are. Are we here for Ulysses Clow? Natasha asked slowly, hoping that Naruto would just spell out what's going to happen. She rarely operates when she has little to no plan. It's just a recipe for disaster. Hey, you know him. This is going to make things a whole lot easier. Naruto exclaimed while still not getting her hint. Just tell me what we're going to do. Natasha finally said, getting straight to the point. Oh. Naruto whispered. Natasha thought she would finally get some details until he heard his answer. 
We're waiting for someone. They should be here any minute now. Natasha is getting frustrated. The mystery works when it's part of their regular date that involves going halfway around the world for brunch in an ex-assassin's restaurant. But when it entails a slightly psychotic weapons dealer, it just isn't advisable. They were waiting near the edge of the forest for five minutes when the trees rustled. The movements of the trees are becoming more pronounced until they are practically swaying violently, similar to when a helicopter is hovering overhead. Natasha was still trying to find the source of the disturbance when she heard Naruto say in a bored tone. Damn. They're finally here. Right after Naruto's statement, a trapdoor seemingly appeared 70m high up in the sky out of nowhere and opened. A black object rapidly dropped from it and landed 3m away from them. Natasha stared at the object until it stood up. That's when she realized it is not an it but a he. The object is actually a man wearing a black overall with silver accents and a cat-like helmet. Natasha's mind is in overdrive, running through her mental database, searching for anyone who has successfully built an active camouflage system and can create a super soldier. The super soldier idea came from single evidence, the guy just dropped from 20 stories high and stood up like it was nothing. The man walked over closer and stared at her for a moment before looking at Naruto. The solid white eyes of the helmet are slightly unsettling. Naruto dismounted the bike without her dismounting first. She noticed that the motorcycle kept itself upright even without the stand. It just gets more amazing the more she knows about it. But she needs to focus on the situation at hand. Natasha also dismounted the motorcycle and positioned the bike between the two probable super soldiers and her, giving her some semblance of cover while she draws her weapons. If the situation they are in turns sour, she needs to be able to respond quickly. The man and Naruto stared at each other through their helmets. Natasha could feel the tension skyrocketing until both of them laughed hard. They removed their helmets simultaneously and hugged each other. Natasha felt so stupid for not predicting that Naruto is already a friend to a super soldier. How's the flight and where's Okoye? I never saw you without her nearby. Naruto asked after they were done hugging. It was good, all clear skies. As for Okoye, she's finding a landing spot. Wabi is with her. The man answered, his smile dropping a little. How about you? I see you're doing well for yourself. He said the last part while glancing at Natasha. Ha ha ha. I wish. This is our first date. Let me introduce you guys. Naruto said with a laugh. They both walked closer to Natasha with Naruto leading. Nat, this is the crowned Prince Chala. The Black Panther protector of Wakanda. Chala, meet the beautiful and deadly Natasha Romanoff. The Black Widow. He introduced them with a smile and a small amount of theatrics. Natasha removed her helmet during the introduction when she heard the man's name. Chala, the prince of an impoverished nation of Wakanda. Well, apparently not so impoverished if everything she says is true. I'm sorry about the surprise. Our friend here probably wants to give you a more exciting activity. Instead of maybe, skydiving or laser tag, he decided to bring you in a matter of national security and secret. Chala said with a bow, while not forgetting to send a jab to his friend. Natasha couldn't help but smile at Chala's assertion. Naruto is certainly a bag of surprises. No problem. Naruto somehow just finds a way to turn someone's worldview around. Natasha greeted back. Chala gave one last bow and faced Naruto. I see you have finally finished your bike. He said while checking over the Raijin. The elegant black motorcycle with burnt orange accent certainly looks intimidating. I want to see which is faster, mine or yours. We should race when we get back. 
nobody would be racing anyone until His Highness settles our current predicament. A voice answered from some distance away. Everyone turned around to look at where the voice came from, and they saw a pair of man and woman walking towards them. The man is wearing a blue cape with a sword at his hips, and the bald woman is wearing red armor while carrying a spear. The woman is observing Natasha, like ascertaining if she was a threat. Okoye. Wabi. What took you so long? Naruto asked animatedly. Naruto. Both greeted him with a small bow. Don't be like that. We're going to be a team later, so you guys need to loosen up. Isn't that right, Nat? Naruto let out loudly, trying to pump up Okoye and Wabi. I still have no idea what we're doing, so I'm not going to weigh in on this. Natasha answered with a small shake of her head. Naruto looked a little disappointed and looked at Chala for support, but he just got more dejected when he heard his answer. The bruises she gave me two days ago are still there, you're on your own this time, my friend. Chala said with a smile. You guys suck. Naruto answered with a pout before looking to Wabi. You should be the happiest of all. We're going to take down the last half of the reason why your father died. He said in a slightly serious tone. The last half? What are you talking about? Wabi asked while taking on a more dangerous tone. Damn. You guys have too many secrets. Naruto whispered to himself. Just ask your king after I get my approval, or you could just ask Clow. He said to Wabi. He then retrieved two objects behind him and tossed it towards Natasha. You might need those. Natasha examined what Naruto tossed her and saw that it is a baton and a mask with a red hourglass. Just flick the baton and it'll extend to a six feet long electrified staff. Oh. I forgot. You also need these gloves. He handed over a pair of gloves. Thank you. Usually, a guy gives teddy bear or perfume, but knives and electrified staffs are good too. Natasha said with a smile. How you wanna do this? Loud or quiet? Personally, I want everything to go boom. Naruto asked Chala, while putting on an orange grinning Japanese demon mask. We'll go quiet first. When we got him, you can go wild. Okoye would be air support. Wabi, go with her. Chala ordered while placing his mask. Wabi was going to disagree with his orders, but a hard glare kept him in line. You're too close to what's going to happen, and you're not a stealthy fighter. And he can. Wabi countered. Naruto decided not to answer, but instead, he just slowly disappear like he is gradually getting more transparent. As soon as he was gone, everyone heard a disembodied voice coming from everywhere. I can be stealthy if I want to. Wabi shivered, slightly fearful. Natasha, on the other hand, just kept cataloging anything Naruto did and trying to make sense of what he can do. Okoye just kept stoic disposition, but the tensing of her shoulders shows that she is still affected. That's enough demonstration, Naruto. You made your point. Chala said while fixing his gloves. Naruto then appeared behind Wabi. All right. Let's do this. I have one more plan for our date. Naruto declared while winking at Natasha, but she didn't see it due to the mask. Okoye pulled Wabi towards the Royal Talon fighter to make sure he doesn't sneak into the fight. Good thing I'm planning our next date. This just feels too much like work. Natasha said in a joking manner. The spontaneity of it all, although slightly discomforting, makes the whole thing more exciting. Naruto walked towards the motorcycle and mounted it. You're going to have to run there, bro. Naruto said to Chala. Natasha immediately got the idea and rode the bike too. 
Chala surrendered to his fate ran towards the target ship, making sure to keep himself out of sight as long as possible. Naruto had no problem with it and shot towards the ship. They rapidly passed over Chala, and Natasha saw a decrepit ship guarded by men with heavy weaponry. The one thing she noticed was that Naruto is a whole lot smarter than he looks. Naruto is using the shadows caused by the setting sun, and the miniature dust storm caused by the changing winds to cover their approach. When they reached the ship, Naruto tapped her legs, indicating they need to dismount. She got off and followed by Naruto. The great thing about the mask, Naruto can use his shinigan to scout the whole ship. When he memorized the entire layout and hostile numbers, he disabled his eyes. He pulled Natasha close and lifted his mask. Tell me if you don't want to do this since I have another thing in mind we could go to. Naruto asked sincerely, making sure that Natasha is still enjoying their date. I have been in only one real date before. Natasha started while lifting her mask, staring deep into Naruto's cerulean eyes. So I'm not an expert, but I can honestly say that I'm having more fun than I have in a long time. She finished sincerely. Naruto couldn't help but feel a wave of attraction hit him during that moment while staring back at Natasha's green eyes. Motherfucker. Go for it. Karama's voice blasted in his mind. Naruto turned off the connection before the date started to make sure there's no distraction during the date, but the bijou banded together for Karama to send the message. Naruto didn't bother arguing with Karama and decided to follow his advice. He cupped Natasha's cheeks and gave her a chaste kiss. Natasha recognizes the fact that setting is not ideal for the first kiss, but hell, if it doesn't feel amazing. Maybe she's a little crazy for feeling this way for someone she barely knows. They were about to dive in for a more sensual kiss when they heard a throat being cleared behind Naruto. They both looked toward its direction and saw Chala leaning against the ship's hull. Oh. Don't mind me. Go on. Chala teased. Teased. Naruto is trying to find the appropriate answer but he just settled on how he felt. I hate you. Natasha and Naruto replaced their mask and adopted a more professional personality. There are 155 guys on board. The target is in an office above the engine room. How would you like to do it? Naruto reported what he saw. One day I'm going to find out how you always do that, but for now, me and Ms. Widow are going to start at the bottom, and you're going to the top. Everyone would take out as many as they can while keeping everyone else in the dark. When one of us captures Clow, everyone will evacuate outside, while Naruto gets a minute of fun. Any questions? Chala laid out the plan. When no one spoke up, Chala nodded, and they separated. Natasha finally noticed that the huge motorcycle they were just riding on is suddenly gone, but she has no time to ponder over it since they were nearing the entrance. She also has no idea how Naruto would get up there, but after everything she knows Naruto can do, she wouldn't be surprised that he can walk on walls. They both approached a hole in the hull, and Chala took a peek inside. He signed that four guys are standing guard at the entrance and two guys are at a railing. He would take down the two guys upstairs, while she would take care of the four guards. Chala ran inside the entrance and jumped six m high and pulled himself towards his targets. While the four guys below froze for a moment, Natasha rushed in and hit the first guy in the face that immediately knocked him out. She followed it up by hitting the next two guys on the torso almost simultaneously. The voltage running through the staff must have been high since the attack dropped them immediately. The final guard is taken down with a well-placed jab at the man's face. When she was done, Chala is waiting for her to finish. I'm impressed. You're almost as good a Koye with a staff. Chala complimented. The duo blitzed through the ship, taking out everyone they encountered until they finally reached the office they were after. 
Inside is Cloud talking with someone on the phone facing away from them. Natasha took out her gun and placed it firmly on Klaus' head, which caused him to stiffen up. I have to call you back. I have an incoming call. Klaus said the other end of the line before turning it off and raising his hands slowly. I don't know who you are, but I'm sure we can work something out. He negotiated. Turn around. Chala said. Klaus slowly turned and saw two masked people, a man and a woman. The alarming thing was that one of those masked people is the Black Panther. Heh. Wakanda finally found me, huh? Klaus said with a maniacal smile. What are you going to do? Kill me. No. You're coming with us. Chala answered before placing something on Klaus' face that caused him to lost consciousness. You should open that shelf. Naruto suddenly said behind them, pointing towards an empty shelf. Chala nodded and pierced the wall Naruto pointed him at using his vibranium claws. He ripped it open and saw hundreds of canisters of rock shards. Great, Bast. How did he take so much? Chala whispered to himself before contacting the Talon fighter. What are those rocks? Natasha asked. Vibranium Oregon. Was Naruto's only answer. The answer to the question Shield was looking for is stating right at her, and it doesn't look good. Chapter 29, The Date Part 3. Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. J January 29, 2007, 1910 H Local. Vibranium Oregon. Vibranium. The strongest metal on Earth. The same metal used in Captain America's indestructible shield. According to Coulson, Howard Stark accidentally found a piece of vibranium, or when he was traveling around Ethiopia. He studied it for a while before World War II came to America, and his attention completely went to helping the government. When the captain asked for a shield, he used the vibranium to make sure it would last as long as it can. He never expected it to be virtually indestructible. If the laboratories they were raiding are studying vibranium, S.H.I.E.L.D. needs to do better against them. Who knew what would happen if they somehow finish studying the indestructible metal? Okoye. How much can the Talon carry? Chala asked through his comms. Naruto is binding Klau for the meantime. Around a ton? That should be enough, if barely. Swing around towards my position. Breach the hull in front of me. You'll understand what you would get when you see it. Chala answered his comms, presumably after Okoye answered. We're going to make our own exit. Naruto, you'll handle reinforcements, it would be loud for sure. He said towards Naruto and Natasha. Naruto nodded and walked out of the door, probably to stand guard. After a minute, a loud impact sound can be heard from the far side of the room, and dust rushed out of the entrance. For the first time, Natasha saw the Wakandan ship. It turned around and opened its rear door, revealing the Okoye and Wabi. Great, Bast. That's a lot of vibranium. Okoye said in shock. Wabi, help the prince load the canisters. She ordered before walking back inside. Wabi walked towards the side panel, and large metal claws extended from the side of the ship. The claws grabbed hold of dozens of, of canisters at a time. Chala tossed Klau inside, then both of them jumped inside the ship, when they heard gunshots coming from below them. Naruto must have encountered more of Klau's forces. Natasha and Chala are rolling all the canisters inside the ship to make room for more. She didn't expect that small pieces of rock are that heavy. The moment every canister in the room are loaded Chala shouted. Naruto. One minute. The back door closed, and they moved away from the ship. Hey. Naruto's still down there. Natasha shouted to Chala. 
Don't worry about him. It's safer for us to be this far away. Chala answered calmly. The Talon hovered around a kilometer away and faced the ship. Natasha could see a bright blue pulsing light is emanating from inside the boat. Five seconds later, the whole ship is covered by a spiraling dome, grinding everything inside it to dust. The dome is producing such a powerful gust of wind that the plane they are in is experiencing strong turbulence. Natasha realized at that moment that S.H.I.E.L.D. wouldn't stand a chance against Naruto in a head-on fight. Bast. So the one he used before is not his most powerful skill. Chala whispered in awe. Natasha really needs to figure out how Naruto and Chala met. The small snippets of conversation she heard suggest that they have some knowledge of each other's abilities. Hey. Let's go. I still need to ask the king. Naruto suddenly shouted behind them. Natasha reflexively turned around, struck him in the chest using the staff. Oh my god. Are you okay? She asked immediately after she realized who she attacked. Wow, that hurt. Naruto said while rubbing his chest, the shirt he's wearing is a little singed. That's your fault too, you know. You just don't appear behind someone and expect not to be attacked. Natasha reprimanded Naruto while placing her hands to her hips. Behind them, Chala and Wabi are placing paralyzing cuffs and a blindfold on Clow. They're like an old married couple. How long have they been together again? Wabi told Chala in a quiet voice. This is their first date. Chala answered in a deadpan voice. Wabi looked shocked at Chala's statement before shaking his head and saying. They would be married on their third date at this rate. Who the hell thought rating is a great idea for a date? Apparently, Naruto does. To be fair, he's a walking nuke, and she's a master assassin. Chala answered with a shake of his head. Just look at it this way, we got what we came for, and we retrieved the stolen vibranium. He finished before Wabi stood up and carried Clow forcefully to a bar and tying him up there. They really don't want him to get away. Naruto led Natasha to a couch at the side of the plane after a few more exchanges and sat down. So, are you ever going to tell me about how you and the prince met? Natasha asked, giving in to her curiosity. That's a good story. Let me set the scene. It was more than a year ago near the southwest border of Sudan, or South Sudan, whatever you might want to call it. Naruto started his story. Flashback start. Naruto just came from Khartoum, Sudan, to establish his branch of Shikugakure. He has no idea if it will even turn up a profit, but he doesn't care. He just needs a home base in Sudan. His next destination in mind, Bernin Bashega of Wakanda. Nairobi, Kenya, would have normally been his next destination, but there's something he needs to confirm in Wakanda because there's something weird going on there. The first thing Naruto noticed was that it's complete isolation. No country would survive for thousands of years in complete isola isolation. Some resources are always unavailable inside a country. The fact that they primarily only export textiles and crafts and almost no import is an insane notion. The second thing is its uninfluenced culture. He can understand if a tribe or two remained isolated and retained their original tribal culture, but a country as a whole. It's just not believable, especially if they are so close to the slave trade and Western expeditions routes. Not to mention the fact that they have no reported standing armies ever since the country's formation, the surrounding states would have pounced to conquer the land, especially in the 1600s to 1800s. For Naruto, something fishy is going on. That's why he's going there himself after the clones he sent to scout the capital reported back. The two information he needs to confirm is the location of the royal family. The family would typically stay at or near the capital as it is the seat of power, but members of royalty rarely shows up in the city. 
Naruto's clones found that they stay somewhere outside the city, but it's also mostly empty. The next one is the weird movement of people. Groups of people would regularly trek towards the Wakandan jungle and return a few weeks later. Six months survey of the villages showed that there is some kind of cycle for each group to go towards the middle of nowhere. Even the caravans that are moving from village to village always travels through the forest, not around it. That's why he's going himself to follow the people to where they are going. Naruto was tree jumping through the forest a few kilometers away from Bainan Bashega when he heard shouting and gunfire from nearby. He decided to check it out and run toward it. When he was around 100 m away, he stopped on a tree branch and activated his shinigan to watch the situation. There's a large group of mercenaries surrounding a slave caravan. All the males are beheaded while the women and children are corralled on one side. The presumed leader of the mercs is interrogating a woman harshly. The leader is wearing a tattered combat suit, hunter's hat, and a necklace made of teeth. He remembers his name as Mufasa. A warlord turned mercenary with a disposition for carnage. They often take the heads of their enemies as a trophy. He usually operates in southern Africa, so it's a wonder why he's this far north. The woman, on the other hand, is wearing an assortment of green clothes. She's acting well enough for everyone else to pass as a refugee or slave, but not for Naruto's eyes. Her muscle development and physiology can't be hidden from Naruto's eyes. I know who and what you are, Mufasa said. You think you're smart by sticking with refugees and slaves, but what you don't realize is that people talk. Give enough incentives, and they would tell you anything. He continued while retrieving his knife and running it all over the woman's neck. Every one of them said the same thing, an angel in green called a man in black, and saved them from a terrible faith. I remember the stories of my childhood. The stories passed down from the ancestors, never fight the man in black. Mufasa walked over to a girl and pulled her towards him. I also remembered the story of a golden city hidden in Wakanda, where the man in black came from. I'm only going to ask you once, Wakandan. He said while placing the knife on the now crying girl's neck. Where is the golden city? Nakia is in turmoil. She's a loyal war dog of Wakanda. Her mission is to serve for the best interest of Wakanda above all others and keeping Bainan Zana a secret. She hardened herself, believing the girl would die today. But Bast seems to give her a gift. Death wails of mercenaries echoed around the outer perimeter. Mufasa's men are dropping left and right, and he can't even see it. Mufasa tossed the girl aside, took his gun, and scanned his surroundings, trying to find the man that's been taking out his man. I know you're there. Mufasa shouted before he shot Nakia in the kidney. He grabbed her and pointed his gun at her temple. Show yourself, or I swear to God I'm going to blow her head out. You got three seconds. Three. Two. That's when a man in a black suit showed himself. Chala has just been appointed as the new Black Panther a month ago, after his father decided that he's not fit enough to be the Panther. An hour ago, an emergency transmission came from Nikia's Kamoyo beads. He immediately took a dragon flyer and set out to help her. When he got to the location, he saw a gruesome sight. Bodies are piled up on the side of the road, while the heads are in the back of an assault jeep. He took out the outer perimeter guard working inside. Chala got spotted by one of the inner guards, and all hell broke loose. Rookie mistake. Now he's in front of a madman with his love rapidly bleeding out, not sure if he can get to him first without him pulling the trigger. Ah. The man in black. The protector of Wakanda. Mufasa theatrically said. The Black Panther. Maybe you can answer where the Golden City is? Chala was now in the same position as Nakia a few minutes ago, but he doesn't have the same determination to let Nakia die. Don't tell him. 
Nakia forced out. She's getting weaker and paler as time goes on. I'm sorry. I can't do that, Nakia. Chala answered. He faced Mufasa. The Bainan Zara is in. He never got to finish his sentence since a stone pillar suddenly impaled Mufasa. Chala was surprised by the suddenness of the man's death. He looked around and saw that all the remaining mercenaries are suddenly impaled. You should help her before she keels over. Over. A voice said out of nowhere. Chala looked back to Nakia and saw her starting fall. He ran toward her and caught her. I got you. You're going to be okay. He said while checking Nakia's wound. It's a through and through. He took a Kamoyo bead from his and Nakia's to plug the entrance and exit wounds. It stabilizes her condition momentarily, but she just lost too much blood. She might not make it back to Wakanda for treatment. He's feeling the weight of the situation when a hooded guy walked over to him and crunched down in front of him. You need help, man? The same voice that told him to catch Nakia came from the man. Come on. Just nod if you need help. The man said in a calm voice. Chala nodded. He would do just about anything to save Nakia right now. All right. Lay her on the ground and move three steps back. Chala was hesitant to leave Nakia's side, but he knows he can't do anything now. Naruto did a single hand sign and placed his now glowing white hands on Nakia's abdomen. Fair warning. I have almost zero medical knowledge. I'm just boosting her resilience. So yeah. Chala almost lunged at the guy, but he can't do any better right now. A few minutes of waiting, and he finally took a sigh of relief. Nakia's color returned slowly, and she slowly opened his eyes. Glad that worked, huh? Naruto said to Chala after he walked some distance back. Chala rushed over towards Nakia and held her in his arms. He removed his helmet and checked her over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chala said in gratitude towards Naruto. He extended his hand towards Naruto. I'm Chala. Crowned Prince of Wakanda, and I'm in your debt. The man removed his hood, revealing a young blonde man. The man took his hand and shook it. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. The now named Naruto introduced himself with a wide smile. Freelance contractor and I'm lost. Flashback end. We talked for a while, and he gave me a communicator. That's how we kept in touch. I did some job for him and worked together from time to time. I also snuck in Binan Zana to leave some packages for him. Naruto ended his story. Baba is slowly losing his mind trying to find the intruder that keeps on leaving him a package. I only told him about Naruto this morning, when he received a package with Klaus picture. The price was a meeting and considerations for his request. Chala interjected with a chuckle. We're now approaching Wakanda. Okoye announced. You're going to want to see this. Naruto whispered at Natasha's ear. She looked out the front window and saw a mountain rapidly getting closer. She was getting nervous, but Naruto just held her hand and calmed her down. The moment she thought they were going to hit the mountain, the plane passed through some kind of barrier and saw one of the most beautiful sights she had ever seen. Welcome to Bainanzana. The Golden City. True capital of Wakanda. Chala declared. Clint's Homestead, Missouri. January 29, 2007. 1500 H local. Clint burst through the door and rushed up the stairs. He went straight towards the master bedroom and saw Laura sweating profusely. Hun, the Johnsons just went into labor before you. The midwife won't be able to come until after she's done. Clint quickly said, clearly out of breath. 
This kind of moment magnifies their living situation. Living partially off the grid would remove some comforts that people take for granted, like going to a hospital. Clint. Take a breath and find the birthing binder. You're going to help me through this. Laura said between contractions. I can take you on the jet and take you to Shield HQ. Clint suggested. Clint Barton is usually calm and collected, but when the life of his wife and unborn child is on the line, the gloves are off. No time, babe. My contractions are three minutes apart and sixty seconds long. We're not going to make it. Laura asserted. You. Need. To. Do it. Clint nodded and ran down the stairs to retrieve the binder, including some ice chips. He checked on Lila, watching cartoons in her room before going back to the master bedroom. Breathe, love. You can do it. Laura reassured. Clint opened the binder and read through it. Chapter 30 an abrupt ending. By Ninzana, Wakanda. January 29, 2007, 2030 H Local. I still can't believe this is the real Wakanda. Natasha said in awe while looking outside the window of the waiting room they are assigned in. The moment the rear doors of the Royal Talon fighter landed, a welcoming party greeted them, consisting of the Wakandan royal family and two groups of guards. One group looks similar to Okoye, and another group that wears the same clothes as Wabi. A few words of greetings and subtle threats, and they were escorted into a room. Natasha thinks that the only reason they aren't attacked was that they brought them Klau and Naruto's presence. Oh yeah. This place is like Singapore on steroids. Naruto said beside her. I just think of it as an advanced hidden village. Hidden Village? What's that? Ninja Training Grounds. Natasha asked, adding the last part as a joke. Yeah, basically. Naruto answered in a straight-laced voice. Natasha immediately faced Naruto, cupped his face, and turned his face towards him. The unique date and the kiss must have been getting to her since she was never this personal or touchy. Naruto got a little surprised at the spontaneity of Natasha, but he just, just rolled with it. Are you telling me there are still hidden villages who trains ninjas? Natasha asked, emphasizing some of the words. Here? Currently? Naruto quietly asked, just to make sure of his answer that would make it a partial truth. Natasha just stared with a slight admonishment, urging him to just answer the damn question. No. No. There are no more hidden villages here. Some schools still teach ninjato, but they're not hidden or something. He answered a little flustered. What do you mean, no more? She continued her questioning while narrowing her eyes. Damn. She caught that. Naruto whispered to himself, but Natasha caught it, and she shook him to recapture his focus. When Naruto faced Natasha back, he saw her slightly pissed off face. I kinda grew up in a hidden village. He mumbled. You mean there's a whole village that can do what you do? Natasha asked in a slight panicked tone. A whole village that can destroy entire armies would change the world order. Well, there are 31 villages, but not everyone can do exactly what I can do. I'm pretty special if I say so myself. Naruto absent-mindedly answered. He would have continued if Komiai's shout about shutting the fuck up. But don't worry. I'm the only one here, like ever. I'm sure no one would show up. Natasha should be catatonic at this point, but the continued left and right of surprises from Naruto heightened her tolerance. She took a deep calming breath and stared deep into Naruto's blue eyes. Is this a third date kind of question? Natasha asked, trying to work out the best solution for the situation. It would be really crappy if the potential relationship ended before it started. 
Yes. Definitely yes. Naruto answered quickly, happy that Natasha gave him an out. Okay. But don't think I'll forget about this. Natasha said in a serious tone. Just know that I never deliberately lied to you. Naruto said in a serious tone. Well, except for the first time. But to be fair, you lied to me too. So mmmmmmm. He continued in a joking tone, but Natasha stopped him by placing a finger on his lips. SHH. SHHH. Just quit while you're ahead. Natasha advised. Natasha pulled Naruto on the couch and chatted about stupid things. Topics that would take her mind off pressing concerns. Like Coulson's favorite car Lola, or Naruto winning eating competitions. The two continued the easygoing conversation until they heard a knock on the door. Okoye opened the door and walked in, followed by Chala. My friend. Sorry for the delay. Their deliberation took quite a while. Chala apologized. What was left unsaid was that the deliberation is about them, whether or not they should be killed on the soot for knowing about Wakanda, or some other solution to keep their secret. In the end, Chala's suggestion was agreed upon by everyone. Baba and the council are ready to meet you now. He said. Natasha and Naruto stood up and fixed their clothes. They then walked towards Chala, who nodded at them walked out of the room. When all of them are out, Okoye closed the room and followed behind them. No one expects you to know the customs. Just get in and stand straight. You're not going to meet in the ceremonial chamber, but in a meeting room. Chala advised the both of them. Don't worry. I got this. Naruto declared in a loud voice. That's what I'm afraid of. Chala replied with a shake of his head. Already thinking about the inevitable social catastrophe Naruto would cause. The group walked in silence across curving and winding hallways, all of which are either covered in precious metals or decorated with exquisite art pieces. After a few minutes of walking, they finally saw a pair of double doors guarded by a platoon of Dora Milaje. When they got close, Chala and Okoye continued forward and entered the room, while a pair of Dora Milaje closest to the door st stopped Natasha and Naruto. Name Title Affiliation The Dora Milaje on the right asked. Naruto immediately got the reason why they were asked and said, Naruto Uzumaki Jinshuriki, the child of prophecy, and the nine tails. Naruto answered. He saw Natasha give him a questioning look by the corner of his eye, and he tapped her arm three times, indicating that it's still a third date question. I have no affiliation, but towards myself and family. Natalia Alienovna Romanov The Black Widow Current Affiliation, Shield Natasha told the Dora Milaje. The two warrior women escorted them inside the room, flanking them on both sides. As soon as they step inside the room, their escorts announced them to the people inside the room by repeating what they said outside the door. Inside the lavish meeting room is a semicircular table, decorated with an emboss of a panther, where five chairs on the rounded side and two chairs are on the flat side. Seated on the five chairs are what presume to be the elders and the king of Wakanda. Each of them is wearing different designs and colors, as well as their own pair of guards behind them. Chala and Okoye stand just behind the king, indicating they are his guards. One by one, the guards of the elders introduce them according to their age. Elder of the River Tribe, Tkotu The man is wearing a green suit, with each piece having a different shade. He also has a green plate inserted in his lower lip and his ear lobes. Elder of the Mining Tribe, Cherenka. The woman is wearing a red dress and an orange coat. She has braided hair and an assortment of decorative beads. Elder of the Border Tribe, Nkafu. 
The man is wearing a blue hooded shirt and cape. His face is covered by bumps, making it look like the skin of a crocodile. Elder of the merchant tribe, Sarati. The older woman is wearing a purple dress, cape, and turban. She's also wearing large gold ear earrings. Elder of the Golden Tribe and King of Wakanda, Chaka. The older man is wearing a black long sleeve top and bottom with gold trims. Guests. Please sit. Chaka said while gesturing to the two chairs at the flat side of the table. Always tell the truth when you're sitting down. Naruto whispered to Natasha, which she nodded subtly to confirm that she heard his advice. The chairs must be connected to a lie detector that only the people on the other side of the table could see. It must be more advanced than every lie detector she experienced, basing it on the technological capability of Wakanda. Before we get on to business, I would like to give my gratitude for capturing Klau. A persistent stain on our history. The king said with a small bow, followed by everyone else in the room. The people of the border tribe bowed noticeably deeper. Chaka raised from his bow. First of all, Jinchuriki, child of prophecy, and nine tails. Quite a peculiar set of titles you have. Would you mind explaining this for us? Nope. I don't want to explain it. Naruto's immediate answer shocked everyone except Chala, Okoye, and Natasha. His rude response drew disgruntled murmur murmurs from everyone in the room. Their escorts are tensing their body to prepare to strike them the moment their king ordered them. Haha. <laughs> My son warned me about you, but I guess you need to see to believe. The king mused with a chuckle. Now. Let's continue to business. Naruto, the first thing I need to know is how did you get clued into the secret of Wakanda? Oh. That's an easy one to answer. You guys are just too obvious. Naruto answered with a shrug. Chaka gestured him to con continue. Three things, really. The most obvious for everyone is your isolationist policy. It is to prevent outsiders from getting in the country. Nkathu interjected. Well yeah. But at the image your country is showing, you should be welcoming trade if not people. What impoverished nation wouldn't want to develop, think about it. Naruto explained. The next thing is the people's movement. The rotation of people to and from the villages is just irregular. You can set your calendar on it. I mean, who the hell would go towards the middle of nowhere? Don't even get me started on the merchant caravans. Naruto ranted. Sarati perked up and asked the question about their tribe. What about our caravans? Naruto gave her an are you serious look and answered. The fastest way from village A and village B is a straight line correct? Naruto asked everyone in the room which most nodded in affirmation. Then why do your caravans move towards the jungle, when the next destination, is just the next village over? The merchant tribe elder almost had to drop her head onto the table with how everyone overlooked a simple detail. She would have to correct that mistake immediately. The last one that I think is the most obvious detail that every country should have caught is that the royal family is rarely where they should be. Naruto sagely explained. What do you mean, not where we should be? We are always here, protecting and leading Wakanda. Chaka questioned. Exactly. You are here. Not in, I don't know, maybe your official residence outside Bainan Bashega? Naruto asked sarcastically. Chaka dropped his head onto his palm. It looks like a lot of corrections should be made to maintain their secret. You're not at the royal palace 99% of the time. Why would anyone believe that's your residence? I see. It looks like we would need to fix a lot of our lapses. We thank you for your help. Chaka graciously declared while feeling a little stupid. Don't be too hard on yourselves. 
Your war dogs are doing an excellent job keeping your secret. Naruto placated their emotions, but he didn't notice their slightly panicked expression. The war dogs are Wakanda's spies and secret police. They serve to protect Wakanda's interest, like keeping their secret and gathering information on potential enemies. Well, except for one. But you took care of that. He finished the last part while gesturing towards Chaka. How do you know about that? Only two people know what happened that night. Chaka asked threateningly. Three actually. His son knows, I think. I'm not really sure. Naruto nonchalantly answered. Chaka paled at the thought. His brother's son should be left in the dark about Wakanda, but now that he knows, another prince can fight for the throne. As for how I know, when I found out about the Black Panther, I just looked for deaths that could be linked back to the panther. He said while placing his hands inside his jacket and retrieved a large case file. He waved it in the air and said, Lo and behold, I found one in Oakland. He then placed it on the table to be examined for later. Naruto suddenly tensed, which everyone in the room noticed, especially the elders, since they can see Naruto's vitals. I hate to be that guy, but can we move things along? An emergency just came up, and I think I could use one of the boons I'm going to ask for. Natasha quickly became concerned since Naruto rarely if ever show signs of panic. What happened? She quietly asked, but almost everyone in the room heard the question. Laura's in labor. I think the baby is breached. Clint is panicking. Naruto quickly answered. He then faced Chaka and said, said, I'm sorry for how this meeting progressed, but as I said, there's an emergency. Chaka wanted to push his questioning more, but his son's advice echoed in his mind. Never antagonize Naruto. He's a walking calamity. We want him on our side. It's not a sentiment due to our friendship. It's a request from a future king. Okay. Let me hear your request. Chaka said, earning various reactions from everyone in the room. I have three. First is for the approval of establishing a restaurant in Bainanzana, but that could be discussed for later since I know you would want some answers. Naruto said, earning questioning gazes from everyone. Second one is for a small lump of pure vibranium, maybe three inches in diameter, that I would like to test. Supervised, of course. That also could be done for later. That's a more regular request, but why would he only want to test it and not take it? The last thing is something I would like to request right now. I want a pair of war dog Kamoyo beads. You can even place a selective surveillance bead in our beads to make sure we won't tell anyone about Wakanda. He finished his quick rundown of request. The last part is convenient for them since Chala's suggestion is to give them a single surveillance Kamoyo bead. With Naruto requesting the Kamoyo beads himself, they don't need to request it on them. Chaka nodded towards a pair of Dora Milaje by the side of the door. They stood in attention and walked out of the door to pick up the Kamoyo beads. After a few minutes, the pair returned and presented it to Natasha and Naruto. Before you wear them, let me warn you. War Dog's Kamoyo beads are the most advanced version we have. It is also the most deadly. The moment you wear them, only a member of the tribal council could remove them. Force removal would lead to the dematerialization of a 5M area. Telling someone about the secrets of Wakanda to someone not wearing Kamoyo beads would also activate the dematerialization. Wear it at your own risk. Chaka informed the both of them. Natasha would have declined the obviously dangerous beads, but Naruto's comforting hand urged her to wear it. A condition for both of you for having these privilege is for both of you to return in two days. Naruto took the bead without hesitation and wore it. Natasha hesitated a bit, but Laura's condition pushed her to wear it quickly. She thought about how their date is becoming more out of hand. 
How the hell can a breakfast turn into her strapping a bomb to her wrist? I'll cook for everyone when we come back so you can taste what would be served in my restaurant. Naruto said quickly before grabbing Natasha's hand and disappearing. On Naruto's chair is a three-pronged knife with some kind of writing. Somehow, the sound of crickets could be heard inside the room. Chaka slumped on his chair. I'm too old for this crud. The king said. I'm sorry, Baba. Chala apologized while rubbing his head. He recognizes the fact that the situation is partially his fault. Oh right. He's your friend. Would he really return willingly? He left that knife, didn't he? What's does it have to do with anything? According to what I observed, he can travel anywhere there's that knife of his. Chala answered his father's question. Okoye handed over to Chaka the case file Naruto left behind. He looks at it for a while, debating if he should reveal the secret he has been keeping from everyone. He called the attention of the already exhausted tribal elders due to the previous meeting and said, Before everyone leaves, let me tell you something that happened in 1992. My brother, Jobu.